the S and P, uh, we had said early last year that I thought there was a 40 percent decline peak to trough. We got down about 20 percent. Then you got a rally. But to get to that target from here, you'd you'd have to have another 25 percent decline. I think that's still in in the cards. Uh, treasuries are are probably a lot closer to their bottom in price, uh, top in yield. Uh, in a, you know, you'll get anticipation of Fed ease, and if you got the mentioned earlier, if you get a weak economy uh, and uh, a safe haven effect, um, dollar is 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 a safe haven. So, you know, I I think that these things are uh, I I think we're well positioned, and it's and it's certainly been working well in the last uh, last uh, couple of months. We're joined today by a renowned economist Gary Schilling, president of A Gary Schilling and Co who previously served on the staffs of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and the Bank of America, and as well as the chief economist, the first chief economist at Merrill Lynch. He was twice ranked as Wall Street's top economist by polls and institutional investor, Dr. Schilling, an absolute pleasure and honor to host you today. Welcome. Glad to be with you. Thank you. Let's talk first about uh, the markets and uh, this downturn that we've been seeing uh, really ever since the beginning of August, late July, but it seems to have accelerated. I'm talking about the declines in the major ind indices at the S&P and the NASDAQ. This decline has really accelerated over the last two and a half weeks. What happens, Dr. Schilling? I think that investors are finally beginning to take the, the Fed seriously. Uh, now, the Fed really started behind the eight ball. Uh, they uh, Early last year, they were slow to recognize the strength of inflation. They thought it was a reopening of the economy, short-term phenomenon, uh, and uh, supply chain disruptions, again, temporary. Uh, so they really didn't start tightening until March. And interestingly enough, U.S. inflation year over year didn't peak, uh, peaked only three months later in June. So the Fed was, was very late. And then on top of that, there was this feeling of investors that, well, hey, the uh, the pattern here is that that the that the Fed will bail out uh, Wall Street, and you had what was called the Greenspan put when Alex Greenspan was chairman. In other words, that that the uh, that the the stock market could put its problems uh, to the Fed, and then you had the Bernanke put and the Yellen put, and the assumption was that Powell was in the same vein. So. Uh, the the Fed really had a lot of credibility catching up, and and I, and I think that the Fed has made it very clear, but it's taken a long time for uh, investors to finally realize that the Fed is serious, and that they're going to go to the mat, and it's it, and it's pretty hard to see how you don't get a recession out of this if we haven't already uh, started to one. You know, we had strong economy in the third quarter, but it probably borrowed a lot from the fourth quarter. Uh, that's a different story, but. I think that uh, investors are finally beginning to realize uh, that the that that the Fed is serious, and that they're they're, they're going to go to the mat. When you say serious, Doctor Schilling, can you please elaborate on what exactly they're serious about? We know they've uh, Jerome Powell has stated his intentions to fight inflation very clearly. I'm looking at the CME Fed Watch tool. It's ranking the probability of no hike by the next meeting. Uh, to be 94 percent. And so uh, when you say serious, do you do you mean to say that they may hike again? Oh, yeah, I think I, I think they probably will. And, you know, the forecasts of what the Fed's going to do are not exactly covered with glory. Uh, so so uh, I don't think you, you, you pay much attention to that. You, you look at the you look at the fundamentals, you look at the situation the Fed looks looks at, you look at the they're they're uh, concerned about credibility. And of course, you, you know, hope springs eternal within the human breast, as somebody said <laughs> many centuries ago. And and the hope is that somehow the Fed is is through raising rates that they're going to cut them. Um, but we saw we saw actually in the in a, in a previous Fed uh, uh, policy meeting uh, that they basically said, "Hey, we're not going to cut rates as fast as we earlier implied next year." And I think that was the beginning of. Uh, people realizing that this is not another, this isn't a Powell put. Okay. In the past, uh, Dr. Schilling, the uh, Fed has kept rates elevated anywhere between eight months to a year, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. I'm just quoting averages. Um, do you anticipate that uh, a, a Fed pivot will not come within the next six to eight months, given historical precedents? 
Yeah, I think it's going to be late. And, and, and the basic reason is because the Fed wants to be absolutely sure that they've killed inflation and killed the dead. Now, if you look back historically in the last four business cycles in the U.S., the Fed funds rate, the uh, federal funds rate, the Fed's policy rate actually declined before the recorded peak in business. In other words, when the Fed saw that they'd done the recessionary deed, they backed off. I don't think that's going to happen this time. So I rather suspect it will be well into next year before the Fed shifts toward ease. And they want to make sure, as I say, they see concrete evidence that that inflation is no longer an issue. Is that when you think equity markets would resume their bull run uh, when the Fed eases by next year? Well, the normal pattern, the normal pattern is that uh, uh, the, small, the bond market is smarter than the stock market, at least in anticipation that uh, that bond investors, not talking about treasuries, which is well, I've been very much interested in for 40 years. Uh, but uh, but what, what happens is that that uh, uh, the Treasury market begins to sense, well, two things. One is the, the, a recession and a recession reduces credit demand in general. It makes treasuries more attractive. And of course, on a safe haven basis, they, they get to be very attractive against other things, uh, uh, weak corporates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so so I, I think you have that you have that uh, you have that phenomenon where they, where you really uh, you really got to uh, expect that the Fed is going to uh, is is going to wait uh, to, to turn toward ease. Well, the uh, with the recent strength of the uh, ten-year note, uh, the yield in particular, uh, the yield curve, the ten-year minus the two-year, is beginning to reinvert back to zero. Uh, there's I guess two ways to interpret this. One, the economy may be recovering, or number two, um, historically, if you look at uh, recessions, uh, the yield curve has had to invert and then reinvert before we officially get the Enver designated recessions. Is that what's happening right now, Dr. Shelley? Well, I, you know, trying to get the the wiggles in this, but that's one of the uh, that's one of the series that's very reliable and one that I've been looking at in terms of recession forecasts, leading indicators. Uh, index is another one, but the inverted yield curve, and as you point out, the, the twos versus tens has been inverted. And of course, what happens is that when the Fed tightens, uh, they push, they, they operate on the overnight Fed funds rate. Now, those effects spread throughout the Treasury curve, but with decreasing intensity. Uh, so what it means is by the time you get out to 10 years, it's much less of an impact than on the overnight rates. Well, when the Fed has really gone out of hat and heavy in terms of raising rates, that means that you get the, the short rates rising much faster and, and much more extensively than the longer rates, and you get the inverted yield curve. And that has been that has been a uh, 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 absolutely faithful forecast of recessions. If you look in the entire post-war period, it's never missed. And of course, it has been and has been inverted. So um, I think that's a that's a, a clear in, indication now. It, it would it would uh, go back the other way. You go back to the so-called normal yield curve, uh, but that's that's only after the Fed really decisively moves toward ease. At least that's a historical pattern. I have to quote uh, today's uh, PCE data. We're speaking on Friday, the twenty seventh of October. So uh, inflation accelerated in September. If you take a look at the core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Uh, but interestingly, also uh, consumer spending was stronger than initially anticipated. Uh, we talked about how the Fed is committed to fighting inflation that could be negative for the equity markets. But I'm looking at the consumer spending report, and it seems like with strong consumer spending, we could anticipate a rebound in an economic strength. So um, looking at these two data points, one could be confused as to where we're actually headed in the economy. No, I don't know on what basis you say you've got a rebound in the economy. Uh, you know, you get a lot of noise from one month to a later, and I wouldn't make that forecast. So you're generally then anticipating a recession? Is that still in the cards? Yeah, I, I think hard the landing? Third quarter, the third quarter uh, was uh, unusually strong, uh, but but real incomes are declining, and uh, you had you had features like about one percent of the GDP growth in the third quarter was inventory building. Now, inventories are something that businesses don't want, particularly when business is weakening. They want to get rid of them. They don't want to build them. So if you build up inventories this quarter, 
they will probably decline in the fourth quarter, giving you a reverse reverse impact. So, you know, I think uh, I think you got to be very careful about uh, simply projecting the the current situation. That's the easiest forecast, of course, is to project the future is just like today. It's the most believable forecast. It's easier. It's it, it's accepted, but. Uh, uh, you know that's not that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for wh- where are the glitches, where are the different things. That's where you add value. You don't you don't uh, add value by rehashing a consensus. It's finding the new, rare, strange, and exotic things. Uh, let's talk about inflation itself then. As I as I said, uh, the, the latest uh, PC number was uh, somewhat hotter. Uh, some monetarists believe that a reduction in the money supply should be cooling for inflation, but um, you know to some extent that's happened. But the M2 money supply growth remains negative, while inflation, like we've seen in the last couple of months, remains sticky. And I'm talking about core inflation. We're not even factoring in oil directly here. So what's going on? Well, uh, uh, the money supply is. Uh, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a dive oil monetarist. <laughs> full disclosure. But the money supply is not particularly useful right now because one of the things that's happened is with the regional bank crisis starting with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, uh, a, a lot of depositors have pulled their money out of banks. So they pulled it out of measures that were counted in M2 and put it in other things like money market funds. Well, that money just didn't disappear, but it doesn't show up in M2 measures. So I think that I think that the uh, uh, trying to get all excited about whether M2 is going up or down, it, it just is it's not very relevant. It's, it's just a, a different situation because of these special features. Ultimately, do you think the Fed will be successful in bringing down inflation to their 2% target in the foreseeable future? I bet on the Fed every day. <laughs> I think particularly with Powell, uh, these guys really got the bit, the bit in their mouth. And, and, and the key reason I keep coming back to is they simply cannot afford uh, not to bring inflation under control. Their cr- credibility, as I mentioned earlier, was very strained when they were slow to react to inflation early last year, and they had to live down the Greenspan, Bernanke, Powell puts. Uh, so they, they had a credibility issue. And I, and I think that for them to reverse gears at this time, that, that would really destroy their credibility. And they have to start all over from even further behind the eight ball. But if they keep monetary policy tight for too long, Dr. Shinley, the other argument is that they could risk like you said, bringing the economy into a severe recession and then boosting the unemployment rate, wouldn't that hurt their credibility as well, keeping in mind their dual mandate? Uh, I don't I don't know that. I, I think that uh, yeah, I think then fear is a fear is a much stronger uh, response than greed at that point. In other words, I, I think that the, the Fed's credibility would probably go up. Everybody looks around and says, boy, these guys are for real. I don't I don't want to fight the Fed. All right. What is your read on the labor market? We've had a strong jobs report earlier in the month. The unemployment rate is still low. Um, one could argue that if co- companies are adding jobs, then they're not losing money. So earnings well, that, are still good. Know, that, yeah, that's, that's that's not really true. If you look at the month over month increase in payroll employment, it, it has been declining, and almost every month for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, so. Labor markets are strong to, relative to the idea that the payroll employment would be declined, but the rate of growth is is definitely easing. And then if you look at things like uh, if you look at the uh, difference uh, the the difference between uh, job availability and the total number of, un- of people unemployed, uh, that that spread is 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 declining. In other words, there are uh, fewer job openings relative to People unemployed. It's still a gap, but it is declining. Another another thing to look at is is uh, quit rates. Uh, you know these are important because people quit when they think they can get another job easily. The quit rate has declined sharply. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things that suggest the labor market is not nearly as tight as somebody people think. And they say if you look at the month over month increase in payroll employment, it, it's been declining sharply. It's about half half the growth of what it was a year ago. If you're still on the f- staff of the Federal Reserve, uh, what would your policy recommendation be right now? Well, I, 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 I would I would uh, I would back the Fed's current policy. I, I think they 
they simply cannot risk loss of any more credibility than they did they did earlier. So I think they have no choice. And yeah, it probably results in recession, but that wouldn't be the first time. I mean, if you look historically, when the Fed jacks up rates, there's only one soft landing in the entire post-war period in the mid-90s. Every other time when the Fed jacked up rates, uh, you got a recession. In a, in a hypothetical scenario, if you had to choose between the lesser of two evils, the, le the two evils being higher inflation or higher unemployment, which would you choose? Well, I, I, I think it has to be higher unemployment right now because inflation is so disruptive. Uh, and it and it has lasting factors. You know, one of the interesting things right now, the inflation rates have come down. They were running 9.2 percent uh, back in uh, back in June of last year, year over year. That was the peak in the CPI. Uh, they're now down to I think 3.7 percent. Okay, inflation has come down, but what hasn't come down is prices. And if you look at the polls, and this is one of the things that the uh, Biden administration I think is is, is really sweaty is that prices haven't come down. Uh, people look around and they say, you know, what am I paying for a gallon of milk? What am I paying for, for a, 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 a gallon of, of gasoline? Uh, in other words, the, the rate of inflation may be coming down, but a lot of people still are not, uh, not really accepting the idea that prices have had this huge jump and they're not coming down. Now, I'm not suggesting they will, but I think it is a, uh, it is a, a very deterrent a factor. Do you think the rising tensions in the Middle East and in Israel in particular will add to inflationary pressures or does that have no impact at all? Well, it, it, it's it's really interesting that they haven't had so far. I mean, you would think that uh, with the uh, energy coming out of the Middle East that you would have a huge jump in, in oil prices. Now, you've got a lot of other factors there. You've got the uh, you know Saudi's OPEC plus uh, that's that's really trying to shorten the supply of, of crude oil because the Saudis, I think, have to have a $82 a barrel uh, price just to meet their budget numbers. Uh, they're big spenders, uh, but uh, you, you know you've got a lot of other, other other factors here. But you haven't had a big surge in in prices, and of course you've had a lot of other uh, supply aspects, uh, uh, frackers uh, in the Permian Basin in this country are. Um, they're 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 not going at a whole hog. Uh, they're more concerned about profits for their shareholders than they are the drill baby drill approach. Uh, but there does seem to be plenty of oil, and so you really haven't had a, a huge disruption there, despite what you would think would be that, because you have you've got the war in Ukraine, and now you've got the mix up with uh, Hamas and Israel. Uh, a lot of factors that you would think would uh, would push up energy prices. Now, Maybe maybe it's maybe it's delayed, but it really hasn't done that so far. Can we just go back to our U.S. bond yields for just a minute? Can you explain the relationship between the ten-year yield, in particular, and uh, equity indices? There's been some periods throughout history where they've been positively correlated. That wasn't the case for the last three months, as the equity markets have gone down, while the uh, ten-year yield has gone up. Usually, when there's a divergence, what does that signal, Doctor Shilley? Uh, <laughs> boy. <laughs> I'd have to say, and this is a this, this is a measure of uncertainty. It measures a lot of uncertainty. Random noise um, really is a nice way of saying I don't really know. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's 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 a it no. It's hey hey hey. If I really knew what was going on, you think you and I'd be holding this interview today? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I would have made so much money early on that I wouldn't I wouldn't want to grace my presence to you even though you're a great guy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I well I appreciate you educating our audience uh, nonetheless. You've had a you've had a very successful career on Wall Street. I I like to just ask you about yourself uh, for the next couple of minutes. Um you've sure. served on the Federal Reserve Bank uh Bank of uh, San Francisco. You've served at the Bank of America and uh, a bunch of uh uh, later on, a few other firms as well on all Wall Street. Like I mentioned in the beginning, you were the chief economist, the first chief economist at Merrill Lynch. Um, looking back at your career, Dr. Schilling, what have you learned about not just the economy, but also yourself as an economist? Did you Was that a profession that you would repeat if <laughs> well, you were 20 years old again today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is, uh, uh, and I don't think I ever got carried away on this, but it's it's a realization that forecasting isn't 
is a, uh, I'm not sure it's even a science, but it's very inexacting <laughs> at, at, a, at a minimum. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're peering into the unknown. You're trying to pick the factors that you think are important. Um, and there is a certain amount of, uh, you know, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. There's a certain amount of that in this, in this, uh, in this situation. Um, another thing I've learned is that uh, being negative is very detrimental to job security. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I forecast recession in 1969-70 when I was chief economist of Merrill Lynch. That wasn't being bullish on America in the Merrill Lynch parlance. Uh, the CEO of the time, Don Regan, fired me because of that. I took my entire staff, went to another Wall Street firm, White Weld, as our first chief economist. But then in 1978, Merrill Lynch bought White Weld. Uh, so the story on the street, which is true, was Schilling's the only guy fired twice by Don Regan. Well, at that point, I set up my own firm. I said, I'm going to reduce the odds of that happening. But it it, it really is true. In other words, most, most uh, analysts on Wall Street are paid to be bullish. And I'm not the only guy who's suffered from having a negative forecast, whether it's correct or not. Uh, but that is one of the that is one of the key lessons that people have to recognize. That when, when you hear these forecasts, you really say, you know, it's like my late mother-in-law used to say, consider the source. What's their motivation? How do they get paid? Did you predict the crashes of 2001 and 2008? Uh, in 2008, I did. Yeah, we, we started back actually in March of that year, uh, seeing the, the big uh, uh, subprime blow up. And uh, to make a long story short, I got involved with John Paulson, you may have heard of. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I was a consultant there, and then I invested with him, and I made 20 times on my money uh, in what was called credit default swaps. But that was, a, that was one of these uh, once-in-a-long-time <laughs> scores, but it was, a, it was a way of putting my money where my mouth was because I was very convinced that Subprime housing was a big bubble and would crash, and it did. Speaking of the banking crisis, this, this just came in from uh, uh, the uh, headlines today. Uh, J.P. Morgan chief Jamie Dimon and his family intends on selling one million shares of J.P.M. Uh, stock. Is this uh, indicative of another looming banking crisis, or is this just Jamie Dimon? I, I, I sure don't know. He. It, it could be a lot of things. It could be just portfolio balancing and so on. I, I certainly don't know the details of his uh, financial structure. I mean, on the surface, you'd say, hey, uh, here's the guy who's considered the, you know, the top banking uh, executive in the country. Uh, but he also said, and this was quoted in the Wall Street Journal a week ago or so, he said, all loans are bad. That's a, that's a, that's a direct quote. It was a headline in the Wall Street Journal, as you can imagine. It sort of gets headline status. Uh, but it it may it may reflect that that uh, he sees problems. Regional banks, we've been uh, much more concerned about it. We we do a monthly newsletter just just uh, sending it, sending it out today and and talk about regional banks. And I th I think regional banks have considerable problems, and a lot of it's because of their exposure to commercial real estate, which uh, I think is very very vulnerable. But you know the big banks um, they got bailed out in uh, in 08. Um, they don't have the vulnerability exposure to commercial real estate that the uh, regional banks do, but uh, uh, they haven't they they haven't covered themselves with glory lately, at least in terms of stock performance. Well, are you seeing similarities between uh, now and two thousand and eight when it comes to commercial real estate and perhaps even the residential side as well? The the problems uh, th th they're certainly sizable problems, but they're not as extensive. Uh, back in 08, you had this absolute nationwide mania of people in uh, with subprime mortgages. You know, everybody, you know, just a widespread use of those by everybody in the country and and, and elsewhere. I, I know reading uh, accounts of towns in Australia who the town council had, had sunk all their net worth into subprime mortgages in the U.S. and of course that that didn't turn out too well. Uh, but you know that was a that was a a a certainly nationwide and in some sense a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, today, you know, commercial real estate is is a problem, and I think if if we're going to have a serious crisis, uh, that's the most likely. 
Uh, and, and of course, commercial real estate with regional banks being very heavy lenders uh, in commercial real estate, uh, they get sort of taken along, taken along for the ride. Uh, but I, I would say that's the most likely, but I don't think it's of the magnitude that we had with the subprime bonanza in 08. Is there anything that either the Federal Reserve or Congress or even the private sector could do to avert this coming recession that you talked about? In other words, what would need to happen to get a soft landing? <laughs> They'd have to. Um, oh, gosh. I, I, you know, I, I think you're at the point that there isn't really much they, they could do. What um, if hypothetically be re-engaged a limited QE tomorrow? Well, I don't think they, I don't think they, they, they would. Again, if they, if they got involved in that, they would admit defeat, and their credibility would go out the window, and they, and they'd be even further behind the eight ball. I just, I, you know, I mean, that would be, you know, there might be a, a temporary uh, respite on that, but in terms of any long-term significant uh, improvements, I think you're quite the reverse. Finally, on the subject of asset allocation. Do you think, given your forecast, do you think that uh, the 60-40 allocation uh, method could still be applicable or appropriate today? Well, that lost you 18% last year. Um, I've written about that in our monthly newsletter. Uh, and, and you know, that was, uh, that's like a lot of things. People are always looking for easy, uh, simple formulas. Well, the thing is, if you had a simple formula in investing and it worked, everybody would get in it it would change the parameters and it no longer would work. Uh, and whether it's a simple formula or a very complex econometric model, it's it's the same it's the same reality. Uh, but the 6040 is is deader than a doornail. Uh, and and uh, will it ever come back? You know, never say never. But but I don't think it's I don't think it's applicable uh, today. And uh, you know, it, it's one of these things. Is say people look for for s simple formulas, but I tell you, you know we're you know, we manage money, and what are we doing? We're very much a risk-off portfolio. We're short stocks. Uh, we're long the dollar. Uh, we're 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 long. Uh, we're long. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, long the dollar, short stocks. Uh, we're short commodities uh, because of worldwide worldwide uh, economic slide. And I like copper in particular because there's no cartel on either the supplier demand side and it goes in almost anything manufactured. Um, so it's very much a risk off uh, risk risk off portfolio. Um, and we're, we're very much top down. We start with the we start with the economic, political financial spheres, see develop a forecast, see what investment themes drop out and and we invest uh, I don't you know I don't think being short is unpatriotic. Uh, we can <laughs> we can be either long or short. It's it's just whatever I think is going to work. Is there a particular sector that you would be overweight and or you think is oversold right now? Well, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think stocks, the S and P. Uh, we had said early last year that I thought there was a forty percent decline peak to trough. We got down about twenty percent. Then you got a rally. But to get to that target from here, you'd you'd have to have another 25% decline. I think that's still in in the cards. Uh, treasuries are are probably a lot closer to their bottom in price, uh, top in yield. Uh, in a, you know, you'll get anticipation of Fed ease, and if you got the mentioned earlier, if you got a weak economy uh, and a safe haven effect, um, dollar is 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 a safe haven. So you know, I I think that these things are. Uh, I, I think we're well positioned, and it's and it's certainly been working well in the last uh, last uh, couple of months. Given your defensive posture, do you own any gold? No, I'm agnostic on gold. Uh, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, there's so many things that can push the price of gold around. Uh, working over old gold mining tailings, uh, political risk, uh, 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 economic risk. Uh, you know, and 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 they all they seem to cancel each other out. If you look at gold, it got to eight hundred dollars an ounce uh, in the late seventies, and then went literally nowhere in even in current dollar terms for twenty years. Uh, and uh, you know, I I just uh, I'm just agnostic on gold. I just I just. Uh, so you think the ultimate safe haven is treasuries and U.S. dollars? 
I think that's right. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. These are these. I think these are very much the the play, and that's the way. That's the, at least that's the way we're investing uh, our clients' money. You wouldn't consider other currencies as safe havens, perhaps the Swiss franc, as an example. Uh, you know why get why get cute and fancy? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, now I'll tell you the only other the only other thing that we are interested in um, is India. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's an interesting story, but I think India is going to uh, supersede China. Uh, they've already got more people than in China, and uh, India has a number of advantages. Uh, first of all, the Indians are good at, at technology, and if you if you look at spending as economies grow, you spend more on services relative to goods. You can only put so many cars in your driveway, but you can spend almost infinite on some money on travel, recreation, medical services. So the Indians are, are good at that. Um, secondly, uh, they have a democracy. Now it's not up to the standards of Canada or the US, but it is a democracy and you compare that with, uh, with China. And the thing about top-down regimes, there's no easy way to change, there's no nonviolent way to change them because the guys who run them hang on to the last minute until they're tossed out. Uh, and, and you know, Russian Revolution, French Revolution, nobody, nobody uh, uh, in a top-down regime ever ever gives up. Uh, so the Indians, they they have a uh, they they speak English. Uh, well, that's a inherited from the Brits, uh, which is very nice in in today's world. They have a, a legal system inherited from the Brits. Again, it's it's kind of messy by our standards, but but it it's certainly a lot better than what they have in China, where they kind of decide you're going to go to jail, and we'll come up with the reasons later. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm uh, uh, we we actually have in our portfolios we have uh, some long positions uh, via ETFs in China, or I'm sorry in India. Final question, Dr. Chilling, I'll let you go. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Uh, you've you've talked about the dollar. Uh, there are some. Uh, anti-dollar uh, or I guess dollar skeptics out there who who may say that long term the U.S. is losing its place as the sole superpower, as the sole global hedge fund, so on and so forth, bringing down the value of the dollar and bringing down the dollar is potentially the global de facto reserve currency. Is this a view that you share or are you even concerned with? Well, the, the easy answer to that is what will, re what will replace the dollar. The dollar is involved in 88% of global transactions. I mean, what what, what will replace it? Uh, Euro, hey, that's a messy situation. Uh, the Japanese do not want the yen to be a, a global currency. The Chinese would like to, but money does not go into controlled currencies. It, it wants free markets. I mean, there's really no there's really no alternative. We did a, a study looking at currencies going back to ancient times. Uh, and uh, you look at the the sole dot, which you probably never heard of, but that that was a currency back in the <laughs> uh, that was a currency back uh, in the uh, in the uh, Middle Ages. But you know, look at I mean, what are the characteristics of, of of a global currency? Well, first of all, you've got to have a big economy, and usually the largest in the world. That's the dollar. You've got to have open markets, uh, which which we have relative to, to everybody else. Uh, you've got to have well-developed financial markets. In other words, not only the economy, but financial markets have to, have to be open. Uh, you have to have uh, easy transferability of funds. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's we, we, I think we had six different characteristics of we gleaned from looking at the history of currencies going back 2,000 years. And, you know, the dollar, uh, the dollar fits in credibility. Okay, dollar's been downgraded by uh, Fitch and... Uh, uh, was at S and P, but uh, you know, again, A two versus triple uh, A, double uh, A versus triple A. But uh, again, whatever's in second place. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, all, currencies are always relative one to another. There's no such thing as an absolute value of a currency. So you always have to look at what what's the alternative. Uh, Dr. Schilling, thank you very much for your time. Where can we learn more about your work? You mentioned you have a newsletter. Is that? Um... Yeah, we do. Uh, it's called Insight, uh, and uh, people can find out about more. Our, our website is www.agaryshilling.com. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, be happy to, uh, if people want to inquire, we'll send them a complimentary copy, uh, see if they're interested in, for, for, uh, in subscribing. We also manage money. If, 
people like our style, we'd be happy to talk to them about well, how we do it. Uh, so we'd love to connect with people if they have an interest in the way we're doing it. Uh, but but we do it, you know, uh, we do it we do it our way. <laughs> the way we manage money is the way my portfolio, my wife's, our family foundation, my kids, <laughs> it's a uh, charitable foundations that I control. I mean, it's it's sort of if people like our style, hey, welcome aboard. But we're not we're not in the one from column A, one from column B kind of approach. It's it's one style. Has your style evolved over the many decades that you've been on Wall Street? Not really, not really. It's 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 really it, it starts by uh, I think I mentioned this. It starts by looking at the political, the economic, the financial spheres, and seeing what forecast drops out of that. And then, and then from there, translating that into uh, investment themes. And as I, as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't make any difference to me whether long or short, whether it's currencies, whether it's uh, commodities, whether it's stocks, whether it's bonds. Uh, it's whatever I think is going to make money. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Schilling. And uh, for the viewers, don't forget to click on the links below and follow Dr. Schilling's work and his newsletter. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Schilling. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.